Okay, so shall we huh? get started? Okay, so I think it's uh, 3.30 p.m. So we can get started. So it's a pleasure uh, to have Michal Kapranov for uh, the last uh, talk of, of, uh, of our conference at IAS. And he will be speaking on perverse sheaves on configuration spaces, Hopf algebras, and parabolic induction. Thank you very much for the invitation and for arranging the time. Uh, my talk will be based on joint work with Vadim Schachtman. And in, in fact, it will be a rather elementary talk. I will uh, indicate some further aspects just in, in passing. So uh, let me start by recalling the uh, classical philosophy of Gelfand and Harish Chandra about parabolic induction. So this is a paradigm in representation theory for many years, and this is still going on now. Uh, so we have, suppose I have a reductive group, a parabolic subgroup, it projects on the Levy, and in this case, we, we can induce and restrict representations. It can be done over many fields, so, but the same, the, the formalism is more or less the same. So there are three components in this, in this game, the induction, restriction, and the intertwiners. So the, the intertwiners are most easily described for the Borel subgroup, then the classical principal series representation corresponding to a character of the torus, and the intertwiners identify a representation given a character and a representation given by a character twisted by an element of the wild group. And again, as, as well known, so that's not, not really the wild group, but the corresponding braid group, which is acting on this. So, and the, the, there can be various versions of this. The, it is, uh, it reappears again and again. For example, we can consider D models on the spaces G mod P. If we consider D models in, uh, equivalent with respect to the Borel, that's already a version of the category O. Or we can consider representations of Hecke algebras. Again, we have inductions and restrictions. So there is some kind of general algebraic structure there. For instance, there is a classical formula. What if we first induct, induce, and then restrict to a different parabolic? So the formula is that it has some filtration corresponding to uh, the uh, labeled by elements of some relative band group. So that, that there is some algebra here. And uh, this algebra is, on one hand, it's kind of rich. Uh, and one can fish, to try to catch many fish in this rich waters. On, on the other hand, it's a little hard to formalize in this generality. So let me discuss one exa another example when it's slightly easier. So what I had before was for representations. That was a categorical setting. You may have a more algebraic setting, but instead of representations, we are dealing with functions, which of course appear as particular vectors in the representations. So we can consider automorphic forms on a curve or finite field. So this simply means that the functions on the uh, modular space or discrete modular space of G bundles on a curve. Of course, there are different versions. For an algebraist, we can consider functions with finite support. Uh, analytically, we can consider L2 completions, or we can consider various completion, uh, sort of rational type completions using uh, summation of formal power series to rational functions. So we have the same, the same diagram now connects uh, bundles with respect to Levy, parabolic, and the full group. And we get the sort of the Eisenstein or other pseudo Eisenstein series map is pull back, push forward in one direction. And the constant term uh, is the uh, pull back, push forward in the other direction. So a cusp form is something which all the constant terms are zero. And again, there is a formula which says that uh, the constant term of the Eisenstein series is certain sum over a relative wild group. So in this way, we, we sort of build uh, automorphic forms from uh, cusp forms on various levies. And spectral decomposition theorem says that this sort of generates in appropriate sense all representations. So there is, again, there is this similar type of algebraic structure. 
So like this formula is this formula for constant time of uh, constant term of Eisenstein series is kind of similar. Of course, it's the reason it's similar because it's basically the same formalism. So want, we want to understand what kind of algebraic structure underlies this. Some kind of algebra of parabolic induction. What are what are the rules of this game? We all are play, we all playing these games. Uh, let's try to understand the rules. So in the simplest way and the most uh, common uh, common approach to getting some fish out of this water is uh, consider a type A case. We can consider groups GLN. Then the parabolic subgroups are products of other GLNs. So simplest case, the product of two GLNs. So then we have Eisenstein series. The Eisenstein series maps uh, acts as a multiplication from parabolic for, from automorphic forms of GLM and GLM to GLM plus N. Again, there is an issue of what exactly we call an automorphic form. If you consider functions with finite support, then it's well defined in this way. If you consider something else, it's a question of convergence of a series. So if you uh, adopt this approach, then we have an associative multiplication. Associative because we can do three of them and it's, there's some commutativity there. And constant term would be a co-multiplication. But then again, so here a, a little lower, I wrote it as rational. It means that if we define it like this, then it will take values in the rational completion. It's easy to say uh, what it is. But in, in any way, in, 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 uh, the formula for the constant term of Eisenstein series simply means that multiplication is compatible with co-multiplication. More precisely, it's the Hopf algebra in a braided category. We consider functions on all possible BAN GLM with a, set, with a so, 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 sorry, vector space is graded by, uh, by N with, with a certain braiding. And with, with respect to this braiding, it is a, a Hopf algebra. And this is a particular case of construction well known as the whole algebra when we consider objects of exact category or of abelian category and consider functions of the model space of objects and do the convolution using uh, short exact sequences. This parabolic subgroup on the top, it sort of represents short exact sequence of vector bound. So of course, classical example is the category of representations of a quiver when we get the quantum group following Ringel. So in this way, we can look at automorphic forms for all GLN as some kind of Hopf algebraic structure and various features of the theory also can be interpreted in this way. For example, cusp forms are something like primitive elements in this uh, Hopf algebra. And speculative decomposition theorem becomes analogous to the milner moore theorem about structures of structure of co-commutative whole algebra, so, or commutative, saying that everything is a polynomial uh, of the primitive elements. Here, of course, it is not commutative and not co-commutative, but and even braided. But the uh, general shape of the statement is similar. So this is for type A, and we want to say. So suppose we have a uh, general uh, group. What's the analogous algebraic structure? Well, of course, we can sort of go down this path and say that we have similar algebraic structure, not as an associative algebra, but something similar. We can arrange all parabolic subgroups. And sometimes those parabolic subgroups are products. And if you have a, a diagram, like on the previous slide, on this slide with L, uh, with L being a product, then the induction or Eisenstein series gives a multiplication. So we can view if you want. So I'm uh, switching back to slide three. Uh, switching back here uh, as, a, as a, some kind of fancy algebra. But it's a little uh, unsatisfactory because we uh, it looks like we invented the problem, invented the concept just for this problem. So it would be more interesting to connect to, to situations which already exist. So, and to do this, I want to consider a very familiar algebraic object. First of all, very familiar geometric object, the configuration space, if you want. It's the space H mod W, when H is a complex Cartan subalgebra in the group, quotient by the wild group. 
This is that's where symmetric functions live. That's where where, where characters live. This is a classical space from representation theory. For example, for the group GLN, this is the symmetric product of the complex line. It's a space of monic polynomials. Now, this H mod W has a natural complex stratification. By in this case, it's by root multiplicities. In general, it's similar stratification by sort of coincidences, vanishings of simple roots. It is non-trivial stratification. This, the open stratum, even in this simplest example, is the set of polynomials the discriminant not zero. So the complement is the highly singular hypersurface, discriminant is zero, and then we look at its uh, singular locus itself and the natural stratum. It's a very interesting stratified space. So in particular, we can speak about the category of perverse sheaves on this stratified space. And uh, up to now, the, the, it, as far as we know, this has not been seriously studied. And the message of this talk is that it is this category, this encodes this mysterious algebra of parabolic induction. In other words, if we start playing uh, with the game of induction restriction, then such constructions, they naturally should lead to perverse sheaves on this space with respect to this stratification. And uh, more generally to their categorical analogs, which we call perverse shoulders. For example, when we deal with representations, that's a categorical level. When we deal with automorphic forms, it's vector space level. Then we have, maybe I'll return to the previous slide. So here we have an algebra of automorphic forms. But if we consider, for, for instance, for every n, we can consider the category of representations of GLM. And consider the sort of direct sum of all those categories, the category of sequences of representations, one, one for each f. Then this category ha has a monoidal structure. The parabolic induction is a monoidal structure. And the intertwiner is a braiding. So this is first uh, interpreted in this way for finite field in the paper of Royal and Street, where they introduced the braided monoidal categories. So it's simply a categorical version of this type of algebra. So now I'm switching back. So what I want to say that perverse sheaves on H of W are very interesting options. And more precisely, I want to just say two features and formally. First of all, we give a description of this category in terms of quivers. There is a classical subject in theory of perverse sheaves. We have a stratified space, and we want to describe I want to describe the category of perverse sheaves in terms of some diagrams, some of vector spaces and maps subject to some relations, in quivers with relations. So in this case, the relations will have the form which are similar to, form, to the formula for the constant term of Eisenstein series, or uh, to the formula for the restriction to, to the second parabolic subgroup, Levy subgroup of representation induced from the first level subgroup. And the second part is that, how do we see the intertwiners? Well, they're already here in the geometry of H mod W, the open part is the classifying space of the braid group. So each time that we have a braid group action on something, that's a local system on the open part. And the point is that we have not only local system on the open part, we have in fact, or should have, uh, the, the full perverse sheet. Let me discuss uh, how it works first on example of type A, because it's easier combinatorially, it's easy to hook in. So we consider what we call contingency matrices. It's a term used from statistics, borrowed from statistics. But actually, we learned this from the paper of Bellinson, Lustig, and McPherson on uh, UQ of GLM. So let me explain more formally. So we consider a, a rectangular matrix of some size P by Q with uh, entries being non-negative integers. This total sum of them, the weight, equal to N. And we assume that there are no zero rows and no columns. Then such a matrix has two margins. We, can, we have the row sums and then the column sums. There will be two uh, ordered partitions of n. 
in statistics, this exactly sort of the two probabilities, and uh, we, we, we get two ran random variables how they uh, how, uh, how they depend on it, on each other. So let's call CM of alpha beta the set of such matrices with margins alpha and beta. Then this is uh, again sort of elementary Bruhai decomposition that it is the quotient of GLM by the two parabolic subgroups corresponding to alpha and to beta. Or it is the same as the uh, quotient of symmetric group by the two products of symmetric groups corresponding to alpha and beta. And this is version of Bruhai decomposition. Uh, in this case, it describes a relative position of two flags in n-dimensional space, say in CN. So we have one flag, flag V1, Vp of length P, and the other flag W1, Wq. There are two filtrations. Then there is a famous lemma, sometimes it's called, I think it's called Sassen House lemma. Then on the graded, associate graded of the first filtration, the second one induces an, another filtration. And we can take associate graded of this. They will be GUR I, GUR J with respect to V and W. And this is identified with GUR J, GUR I with respect to W and V. And MIJ are simply the dimensions of this GUR I, GUR J. So they sum to the dimension of the space. So that's an elementary combinatorial object. On the other hand, this object parametrizes cell cells of a cell decomposition of the symmetric product. So it's here on this picture on the right. So what's symmetric product? It's a, it's a divisor. So we have some points with integer multiplicity, positive integer multiplicity, some, sometimes zero. So we look uh, uh, at the non-zero points with non-zero multiplicities. Look how many different real parts are there and how many different imaginary parts are there. Suppose they are P real parts and Q imaginary parts. So then we form a P by Q matrix wherein the corresponding uh, entry will be the multiplicity of the point that this, uh, with this real part and this imaginary part. This is going to be a contingency matrix of type P by Q. And if you consider uh, the set of all divisors with this property, it's going to be a cell. It's going to be a regular cell decomposition of the configuration space. One can describe the, how the closures are included. In fact, the order of inclusion of closures subdivides into two. The, uh, the horizontal one, less or equal prime, and vertical one, less or equal second. Simply means that one matrix is obtained from another by adding some adjacent columns. Or we can add some adjacent rows when things move together. And the full order is generated by those two. There is one extra feature here, which we call the anodyne inclusions or inequalities, where there is no addition happening. For example, in this picture, the first column and the second column, if we add them up, so we'll, each addition would involve one zeros. So no, no positive numbers will be actually added. So such inclusions we call anodyne. Uh, and in this case, uh, another interpretation is that those two cells, they lie in the same complex stratum, stratification by multiplicity. So it's kind of remarkable that the same object, uh, contingency matrices, parameterizes on one hand, I'll switch back, uh, the Bruja decompositions, various orbits in the Bruja sense. And on the other hand, it parameterizes cells in a cell decomposition of the symmetric product. So now, do, do we need to have a break after 20 minutes? So. It's up to you. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, so may, may, maybe I'll, I'll just continue. So, because we already started discussing, maybe may make a short, short break after this. Okay, so, so we have contingency matrices, they parameterize cells of the cell decomposition. And we have a statement, in fact, we have a more general statement for H mod W, I'll describe it uh, 
in a moment, but let me describe it first for the symmetric probe. So that the category of perverse sheaves is identified with the category of diagrams, and we call such diagrams mixed Bruja sheaves. They consist of vector spaces parameterized, labeled by contingency matrices, summing up to n, and two types of maps. One for the horizontal inclusions, it goes in one direction. If m uh, greater or equal than n in the first sense, it goes from em to en. And if m greater or equal to n in the second sense, then it goes from n to m in both transitive. So this looks a little bit like a mixture of a sheaf and a co-sheaf. Remember that we have uh, a, a regular cell decomposition. So if you just have the poor set of cells and have a representation of this poor set, that would give simply a constructible sheaf with respect to this cell decomposition, a cellular sheaf. Here we have a sheaf in one direction and core sheaf, so to say, in the other direction. This is in line with perverse sheaves being some, somewhere in between sheaves and core sheaves and intersection homology being in between cohomology and homology. So, and they subject to the relations that those two arrows, types of arrows, they commute, but they commute in the following form that the product in one direction is equal to a uh, sum over, the, we can view it a little bit like Cartesian squares. And really those M, which are in the middle here under, under the summation sign, it's really some coset with respect to, uh, of the double coset with respect to wild groups. So this is really similar to the formula that really, really similar to the formula for the constant term of Eisenstein series, or to the formula of a uh, co-product of a product of a co-product. And second condition is that anodyne d prime and del prime and del, del second are isomorphisms. So if again, if all of them looked in the same, were in the same direction, it would mean that we have a cellular sheaf for the cell decomposition in which the generalization maps are isomorphisms whenever cells lie in the same complex strata. And it will describe simply constructible sheaves with respect to complex stratification. So here we inverted, so to say, one direction, and it has this hyperbolic flavor like a hyperbolic a singular point of a vector field, there is inflow in one direction, there is outflow in the other direction. Okay, so maybe, maybe let, let's make a little break for five minutes if that's there. That has to be. Misha, I, I missed what anodyne meant. Oh, okay, okay, let, let, let's get to, the, to this one. So if you have an inclusion of inclusion or inequality between such contingency matrices. So they have horizontal uh, or, or contractions. Horizontal contraction means that we add two, row, two columns together or more than two adjacent columns together and again, some other columns together. So it's called anodyne is when we add, we never add two positive numbers. Ah, okay. So here, for instance, the first column and the second column, if we add them, we get a, we get a one column in which will be simply the same integers just rearranged and not, no addition, actual addition is required. We add mm -hmm. M22 with zero and M1Q with zero and M11 with zero. So, and this means that the corresponding cells lie in the same complex strata. Oh, that's right. These are kind of real, like you get these, you get this description from taking some real points, yeah? Yes, yes. So, so this, is, this picture represents the complex plane. A complex number has real part and the imaginary part. Mm -hmm. We just do the most uh, retarded thing. We have a divisor bunch of points in the complex plane with multiplicities. We look how many real parts of these points are present. And look how many imaginary, imaginary parts are present. So we draw those, those lines, those, this grid. In this grid, we get a, we get a matrix. 
So that's, the, let's call this the, the matrix of a divisor. And let's consider all divisors with a given matrix. That's a certain local, certain set in this of points in the symmetric in, in the symmetric product. So the real, uh, real uh, analytic set of points, some analytic or something. It's a cell. So, and here we require that d, d, uh, d prime and this del, del prime l del, del second corresponding to anodyne inclusions are isomorphic. This automatically gives, for instance, a local system on the on the stratum. So just one second. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to continue, if it's okay. Sure, thanks. Huh? Okay. So, so we have the statement which uh, mimics in many ways uh, the formula for induction and restriction. So in general, it is similar. I, I just wanted to start with, with type A. One simply has to use a more uh, Sophisticated combinatorial language. So instead of uh, of uh, contingency matrices, we use again in that interpretation the Bruja orbits. So consider for all possible subsets of simple roots, we can cons consider such sets of double cosets. One can write them as double cosets, but it's easier to write like this as a coset of the product of two of two left cosets. Because in this case, it's interesting to look at the orbits themselves like this. So if M, like bold face M, is, a pro, is an orbit, is a W orbit in W mod WI cross W mod WJ. Of course, it's the same combinatorically as a coset, but the orbit itself is interesting. And similarly, we have OM corresponding orbit in G mod PI cross G mod PJ. So in this set is our, our, our in, probably in the form as a set of double corsets was called the double, double Coxter, Coxter complex by Peters. But from this point of view, we also see that it has two types of contractions, uh, a greater or equal of the first, type, first kind and greater or equal, equal of the second kind using the projections, say PI with us in the first argument, we have PI and consider to PI prime or PI1 to PI2. So one orbit projects to the other. So in this case, we have a relation of the first kind or with respect to the second argument. And again, we have a cell decomposition of H mod W uh, simply as the quotient of product of two copies of the Coxter complex. So if we consider the real Cartan is decomposed into whale chambers and their faces. That's known as a classical Coxter complex. And the faces of this Coxter complex is precisely the union over all i of such sets of cosets, w mod w i. So xi is simply the set of faces of c cross c mod w. So we have the same cell decomposition, which again is, is from the conceptual point of view, is rather interesting, the same. Combinatorics parameterizes Bruja orbits and parameterizes cells in H mod W. So the concept of anodyne equalities here also can be defined in several equivalent ways. So first of all is when two cells lie in the same complex strata. Uh, second, if the map of the corresponding orbits. So it, it orbits exactly this way. I switch back to, to this picture. 
orbits inside W mod WI cross W mod WJ. Not double cosets, but this type of orbits as sets. So this type of orbits is a bijection. The corresponding map is a bijection. Or the corresponding G orbits in product of the two flag varieties, its map is not a bijection, but what in uh, people working in motivic homotopy theory called A1 equivalence. In other words, it's a vibration with fibers being a fine spaces. In principle, such an orbit, it uh, fibers over certain G mod P, some other G mod P, the fiber being a fine space. And uh, in this case, it's exactly that this is, uh, if this map is uh, an A1 equivalence, it means that inclusion is anodyne. So in a way, we have the universal motivic Bruja sheaf when EM is the motif of OM, so to say. And what's important here is that this, <coughs> this formula with the union or sum over M between M prime and N in two senses. There was M prime was in between M prime and N in one sense. And we look at M, which is sort of between them in the opposite sense. So they form simply an orbit decomposition of the fiber product with respect to the projection. So we have projections here, here and here. So we can take the fiber product and it will decompose. And here it will take the fiber product, it will decompose. Again, that's, that decomposition is yet another manifestation of the view high decomposition. So and from this point of view, it's clear in the motive, motive category, we have uh, such decomposition with respect to cut and paste relation means addition. If you do get, go to some motive Grotten group, uh, it would be addition. So now let me consider an example of this application of this theory. Suppose we have a braided graded by algebra. So we have a braided uh, abelian category with the braiding and we have a by algebra so, so with the uh, graded by non-negative integers with the zero part being the unit object which serves as the unit and the co-unit. Then for every M we can form a mixed Bruja sheaf, a diagram of the kind I described before for GLM, but it will have values in the category V. So if V is the category of vector spaces with some other structure, it would be, it would consist of vector spaces with this other structure. So for every contingency matrix, we form the, let's say two dimensional product of the corresponding components of the algebra A. By two-dimensional product, I mean uh, the interpretation of braided, braiding or braided tensor product given by the lean. So in that interpretation, if we have objects, say VI, so in this line with the blue, uh, if you have objects VI of a braided monoidal category, and we have ZI being distinct complex numbers, then we have a canonical object tensor product of VI positioned at ZI. If we ignore the ZI, we cannot just write tensor product over I in I of VI. This doesn't make sense. We need an order. But in fact, we need a little less than an order. It's enough to have a two dimensional order. If we arrange them in the plane in the different positions, we can speak canonically about the problem. So now let's do this. If for those points, let's just then put them in a matrix order, put them in a grid. So A, we have a, a matrix of integers. For every integer, we have the for every matrix element, we have the corresponding component of A. Let's put at the position IJ, and then we take this two-dimensional product and get an object of the braided category. Uh, and in this case, we can define uh, D, D prime by the multiplication and D second by co-multiplication. And uh, axioms of Hopf algebra interpret directly as uh, compatibility as the relation. Let me sc scroll back a little. Uh, at, this, uh, at this condition one here. So I'm, I'm go going back now. So in this way, we get a perverse sheaf on the symmetric product, but with values on V. We can consider perverse sheaves with values in any abelian category. 
but we can do this for every n. So we have a system of perverse shields on. We have a system of perverse shields on all the symmetric products. And the system is uh, what people call factorizable. So if we restrict it to an open part, when it, which reduces to the product of two, of two symmetric products with some distinctness condition, then this shift will restrict to uh, exterior tensor product of the corresponding sheaves on the factors. And this gives the statement, which we proved earlier, that there is equivalence between such factorizable systems of perverse sheaves and, uh, and such graded by algebras. So let me discuss some uh, uh, antecedents of this work. So it didn't appear in vacuum. So one of the earlier antecedents, and of course, it, it, it's not the earliest, is the work of Bezrukarnikov, Finkelberg, and Schachtman on factorizable sheaves and quantum groups. When some particular factoriz factorizable perverse sheaves on symmetric products, in fact, on Cartesian products of C, uh, the singularities in various diagonals, well, re related to, uh, to, to quantum groups. And in, in particular, there are various levels of the statement that there is some feature, some cohomology of those sheaves correspond to some weight space of representations of quantum groups and so on. And this was uh, sort of reinterpreted by Dennis Geisgeri in his notes on factorizable sheaves from 2008. In, in a more uh, systematic way using run space. So as somehow the general circle of ideas underlying it is uh, Luria's uh, interpretation of Kazul duality between Hopf algebras and E2 algebra. So Hopf algebra has a multiplication and a co-multiplication and Kazul duality interchanges algebras and co-algebras. So if you take Kazul dual with respect to co-multiplication, then we get two multiplications and they sort of commute homotopically. That's an E2 algebra. So all of this uh, so amounts a certain two dimensional point of view on Hopf algebras. And this with some benefit of hindsight, we can say that this point of view corresponds to conformal field theory in physics. So now our approach, so views this as sort of type A statement and it extends to arbitrary root systems. More precisely, somehow the thought is like this. If we were on type A, then we would have whole algebra. We would have something like a Hopf algebra. We would have some factorizable data on symmetric products. But now if we are not in type A, then we don't have an algebra, but we still have something on the analog of the symmetric product, namely on H mod W. So maybe I'll now consider some elementary details about the orbits here. So our experience was that it's useful to consider the orbits themselves. So in this picture, uh, in this diagram, it is the orbit for group GLM in the product of two flag spaces. So such an orbit, uh, it, as I said, it, can, it has a compact part and a fine part. And that sort of it has two natural compact parts. If you have a, if you have a contingency matrix, th then you have the ordered partition obtained by reading all the rows in a sequence. The first row, then the second row, then the third row, and so on, will be a long ordered partition. And let's call it, let's call it HOR of M. And there will be a projection of OM with a flag variety of Hor L, which refines F alpha. And that one will be A1 equivalent. Similarly, we can read the matrix vertically. First column, then second column, and so on. This gives a partition ver M. And it projects on the, on the F ver M, which refines F beta by A1 equivalent. So, and for any G, it, 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 it is similar, one can say this. So this Hor M is simply, corresponds to this filtration. So when I wrote gur i gur j, so it means that on say gur j, 
the other filtration gives a, gives a filtration. So on every GERD J, there is a filtration. We can pull it back. We get a long filtration on the original space. And this is filtration corresponding to HOR M. And if you have GERD J, GER I, this would be a long filtration corresponding to VER M. And this can be said directly in terms of parabolic subgroups. It's not so difficult. Now, let me consider some a simple example, the simplest, simplest context of a Hecke algebra, how we can upgrade the induction restriction gain to a mixed blue hash sheet. So usually, uh, people consider, so, so simplest context is when we consider functions on the FQ point. And we consider the standard parabolic, we consider the standard flag space, we consider the functions on the, on the standard flag space the simplest induced representation. So they, they themselves are connected by pullback for push forward. But in our description, we have a little redundancy. We have many uh, labels. Labels correspond to such orbits M. And we found it convenient to consider, instead of doing this, instead of VI, we consider functions on this orbit, which are lifted from the horizontal part. It's a, the orbits are map mapping into each other. And it turns out that those are preserved until pull, pull, pull back and push forward. And we get a mixed blue hash sheaf. So in this way, we, we get a perverse sheaf on H mod W, which is, uh, in, in this case, it's not hard to find. It's uh, uh, the perverse extension, Gareski McPherson extension of a local system corresponding to representation of Hecke algebra. But this example shows that it's useful to work with the, those orbits themselves. Similarly, when we consider representations, we can also play this type of game. So and this can be categorified, for instance, if we consider D models over complex points or D models invariant under the Borel, then we consider similarly D models here, which are lifted from the flag space and invariant under Borel. So in this way, we get, a, we get a diagram of categories, which is analogous to mixed Brewer sheaf, which would correspond to a categorical analog of, of a perverse sheaf, something they call a perverse shock. So this shows that uh, H mod W somehow uh, encodes the algebraic structure of of the parabolic of the parabolic induction algebra, and this we find it, uh, an interesting phenomenon. So probably that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments? Yeah. Go ahead. I might not see you. Go ahead if you if anybody has a. Question. Um, just a, an elementary question. So you said that you can, in particular, produce a local system on the open part from this yeah. algebra data. Can you say again how this works? Oh, okay. Yes. So, so let me scroll a little. I, I apologize for fl flicking it. Yes. Yes. So we ha we have. Uh, if anodyne d prime in the second are isomorphisms, then we can go, we can invert the other one, and we get a representation of the post set of, of, of cells. We get a, we get a representation of post set, or, or let me say it this way: we consider the open part; it's a union of, of a certain cells. It sounds like this for which all the embeddings are, or the inclusions are anodyne. Such a diagram would give simply a representation of the post set of those cells, which is, which is sort of a redundant way of defining a local system. So it's like instead um, of moving points continuously around, you kind of go, duck, 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 yes. Duck, 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 duck. Yes, yes. So in a way, it's analogous to describing a local system as a representation of fundamental group point rather than the fundamental group. We have many 
sort of different base point, one, one base point in every cell. But, uh, okay, so the follow-up question. So, um, so for the, for, for the, there are many categories in nature where uh, the Bray group acts. And yes, uh, yes. So but yeah, for instance, them, putting them yeah. into this framework, I mean, is yes, way to do that? Yes, I think, I think so. Like for instance, the, your, your classical example of braising break group action on the flag varieties. Well, it, it, it is a categorification of the, uh, of that last example. So we can consider uh, categories. So, so let, let me get scroll to the last slide. We can consider uh, categories of, say, sheaves or demoders on the orbits, which are lifted from, uh, from say, F or M, lifted from the compact part. So in fact, in doing this, maybe I, I, I'll say this. This picture has, has uh, the intertwiners, the correspondences which give the intertwiners already pre-installed, so to say, like in a computer program, something can be pre-installed. When we have, a, 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 say, intertwiner, uh, between two Schubert varieties. So then the projections are, uh, projection are A1 equivalences. So when we consider functions which are already lifted from this, it means that we already lifted, we did half, uh, half a step towards the intertwiner. Well, when we after this do push forward, then it is the intertwiner. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Maybe this is a silly question, but if you uh, cons if you keep track of the stabilizers of the points that live along the uh, flats of the hyperplane arrangement, um, so then you would consider perverse sheaves not on the quotient h mod w, but on the stack h mod w. Yes. Yes. Is that it was a slightly different? Yes. Yeah. But it, it, it's po it, it's probably possible to f figure it out. But it's can for, for this purpose, it's, con it's convenient to consider like this. There, there is clear relation. Then we can take invariant and the other thing. Yes. But he, he, here it's sort of it is convenient to consider it exactly like this, not on the stack, but as on this space. So is it not interesting to think about the stack? Is it no, uh, it, just no, it's interesting, but. Uh, somehow, that's how we originally tried to do this, but we simply got uh, got confused. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions, comments? Just uh, briefly, so I guess you could also um, like give a combinatorial description of, for example, complex um, mixed Hodge modules in terms of complex mixed Hodge structures at every point and then some compatibilities. Uh, possibly, yes, yes, there is a little, uh, uh, yes, you, you, you're probably right, we did not uh, actually uh, try to do this seriously. Well, one thing is slight discrepancy between description of G-modules and perverse sheaves. Mixed Hodge modules, they consist of, of sort of two, uh, two parts, a G-module description and a perverse sheave description. So, no, of, co of course, they're equivalent. It's, it's, so I think you are right, I, and I, I think it's probably possible to do this, and it probably is, is important, yes. We, we were just a, a little intimidated, that's all. Because one could also dream, that, like, and then you could kind of have a, like a shorba of mixed, mixed hodge structures or something, and I have no idea what that would be. Yes, yes. No, 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 there is another sort of issue how to understand what's the analog of a mix of a Hodge uh, structure on, for a Shoba. Yes, and this we discussed in particular uh, with, with Roma and with, uh, with other people. So, so, so pro probably one, uh, th one thought would be uh, that something like a stability condition looks a little bit like a Hodge structure. So one can pro pro uh, probably play with uh, categories 
triangulated categories, Schober for, for, formed for, out of triangulated categories with compatible stability conditions. But again, we, we cannot say much. It's just an idea. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So maybe maybe something uh, simpler. Uh, so if you start with uh, um, with uh, uh, in your earlier theorem with a the bi-algebra that has a uh, that's uh, quasi-triangular. I mean, you have the R matrix. Does it correspond to something on the? Uh, so yeah, let, let, let me get that. Uh, so, so again, this sort of. Uh, tried to say something, but couldn't because this goes beyond. Uh, to speak about quasi triangular, you don't need a braided, you need not a braided category. Yes. You need, need symmetric, a yeah. symmetric category. Symmetric, yes, yes, I see. Yes. So, so, so we, just, we just felt a little bit out of the elements yeah, that followed the natural train. It was a little bit uh, away. In, in a way, uh, uh, quasi triangular half algebra itself produces a braided category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know how to say. It. I just don't know. And another, another question. So you were mentioning uh, factorizable shifts are the, yeah related yes. to factorization algebra or something like that. But there is no. Uh, uh, it looks what you're doing is kind of topological. Uh, I mean, I don't yes. see conformal. So you is there is there a holomorphic version of of uh, of your theory? Oh, no. What I mean is factorization algebras. I, I mean. Uh, so if you consider factorization algebras, which are locally constant on the plane, it is the same as E2 algebras. This is the interpretation of Luria. So, 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 so vertex algebras are holomorphic. Yes. Uh, sort of, uh, uh, the vertex algebras, are, vertex algebras are, are like uh, holomorphic to E2 algebras, you agree? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so it's like we consider function, we consider locally constant shapes, we consider coherent shapes, we consider the, the RAM complex, we consider the Dolmo complex. So we consider locally constant functions and holomorphic functions. So if we consider locally constant factorization algebras, this is the same as E2 algebras on the plane. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is really that, yeah, you would, want a, you would want a holomorphic dependence, so not something locally constant on the plane, but something which is really, uh, uh, an O module or something like that on the plane. So that's uh, yes, but this is this is uh, like uh, looking at this list of uh, works. I, I think that's the idea of conformal blocks. So we start with something holomorphic, like a vertex algebra, and then produce out of it data on the configuration spaces of of, of more of more locally constant nature. And I mean, there's one related thing is the, um, I mean, in, in, in type, so in type A, you can, uh, uh, if you take the shift D on the, or in any, in any type, you take uh, the D modules on the open complement, uh, you yes. can extend that uh, uh, <coughs> to a shift on, of algebra on the whole thing uh, in this, uh, whatever, rational Cherenic algebra or whatever, it of uh, construction, okay? So on V mod W, you take O on the, Oh, the complement okay. oh, the okay. and you have this uh, you you have this uh, tree you don't extend it as a d everywhere you extend it as a so you can deform the extension so that oh, okay. on the open part it doesn't change uh, oh, oh I, actually I, I, I did not I, I, I did not know this I, I didn't understand that okay so that actually may be very interesting yes I see what, what you're saying so there is an object which is also kind of factorizable you, you, you are saying well, it's it's something. It's there's an object depending on parameters um, that uh -huh. is always D on the open part. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But that uh, that's that's uh, much more interesting than uh, uh, D uh -huh. uh, when the parameters are non-trivial. Just a second. Can you just indicate some reference for this? What the... I, I think the, this interpretation is uh, due to probably to Ettinghoff, uh, paper of Ettinghoff on. Uh, on uh, I forget what he calls that. Uh, uh, some geometric version of. Uh, Ah, okay. okay, okay, I, I looked at that. No, I didn't know that. Okay. So I wonder whether this is something that um, maybe uh -huh. that yeah connects to uh, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because this in turn is uh, uh, in type A. Uh, 
there's this uh, whatever Arakawa Suzuki construction uh, that says that the construction of conformal blocks, uh, which yes. for certain particular systems uh, uh, you would have a representation of the group. So you on on P1 minus uh, n plus one points. Uh, yes, yes, you're yes, going yes. to get uh, okay. So now if you take suitable systems, you it will factor also the Heckler algebra. Okay, that's yes. a conformal group. But what Arakawa Suzuki do is that they lift uh, this before uh, taking the all this co-invariant whatever business and before integrating mm -hmm. you can do you can do a little uh, less and you don't kill as much somehow and you get something which is going to be uh, uh, a shift over that thing over that uh, uh, mm -hmm. deform extended uh, ah, uh, kind of, a shift of and then you rest this shift of algebra, I think. yeah you see it's going to work to live on the whole uh, h mod w whereas uh, yes, yes, when you yes. do your monodromy thing it lives only on the regular part but what they show is that you can lift it to 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 a, a shift over this thing which is not d module which is a deformation of d module so they lift the conformal block construction uh, oh, okay. Suzuki. so that's I, I wonder whether it all fits with your with your uh, it may, I, point I, I of view but it's not wrong. that would be interesting because it would it would not be on the d module so that would be maybe there's a way to do it on the constructible side uh, and that would be great yeah. yes 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 thank you thank you that's interesting are there other questions or comments huh? okay maybe not if not thanks very much again hi thank you. And thank you very much to all the speakers of the week. I think it was a yeah, great week, it was a amazing talks. Thank you again. And thank you to Jordi for organizing the whole thing, the week, the whole year. <laughs>